The 13-inch MacBook Pro M1 versus the 16-inch MacBook Pro. Which one should you buy for video editing, graphic design, and motion design? If you're a creative professional looking for the best MacBook Pro, this video was made just for you. Let's get rocking! If you're new to the channel, my name is Benji Kaiser. This is where you're gonna find the best tech and tools for creative professionals. So if that sounds like your kind of place, consider subscribing. Also, if you're curious about the exact pricing or availability of either of these models, as we're going through the video, you can head down in the description below and click one of those links. Now, if you do make a purchase of that link, we'll get a small commission, but at no extra cost to you. And that's what keeps this channel alive and the helpful content coming your way. As always in my videos, we start with the build quality first. And when it comes to comparing a MacBook Pro to a MacBook Pro, there's not a lot to discuss here. They are both come with all aluminum chassis, scissor switch keyboards, 720p webcams, and retina screens. Since most things are the same, I'm going to quickly cover the most obvious differences, then get to the juicy details regarding the performance benchmarks. First, one of the biggest differences is the size of the speaker grills on the keyboard deck. The 16-inch MacBook Pro comes with six speakers that have an immersive audio experience. Sadly, the latest 13-inch MacBook Pro did not get the same upgrade. It is still better than most Windows-based laptops, but it's not as good as the 16. The next obvious difference is the screen size, with the MacBook Pro 16 coming with, well, a 16-inch screen, and the 13-inch MacBook Pro coming with, well, 13.3 inch screen. Concerning battery life, the MacBook Pro 16 will get roughly 10 hours of web browsing at 150 nits of brightness and about six to seven hours of design and video editing out of its 100 watt hour battery. Whereas the MacBook Pro M1 will get roughly 14 to 15 hours of web browsing battery life at 150 nits of brightness and about eight to nine hours of design and video editing with its 58.2 watt hour battery. Lastly is the webcam. They both have 720p webcams, but the 13 inch got a little AI improvement for clearer video during video conferencing. Per Apple style, each laptop comes with a very pared down selection of ports. On the MacBook Pro 16, you get four Thunderbolt 3 ports with display and power delivery, with also a mic and headphone combo. Um, and for the MacBook Pro M1, you get two Thunderbolt slash USB 4 ports that cover display and power delivery, and you get that mic headphone jack combo as well. As I open the lid on each of these laptops, I'm able to do so with one hand. The hinges are smooth and strong. There is no screen flex for the MacBook Pro 16 or the MacBook Pro M1. I love Apple's single hinge that spans the entire keyboard deck. It makes for a very sturdy build. All right, now that we've covered those details, let's get into the screen quality. The MacBook Pro M1 can reach 303 nits at full brightness with a color gamut range of 100% sRGB, 89% Adobe RGB, and 100% DCI-P3, all to Delta E of 1.18. I was surprised with the lower Adobe RGB, but it makes up for it with the DCI-P3. The MacBook Pro 16 steps in a little bit uh, with its 16-inch screen. The MacBook Pro 16 can reach 431 nits at full brightness with a color gamut range of 1.18. 100% sRGB, 91% Adobe RGB, and 97% DCI-P3, all at an average Delta E of 0.27. So regarding the color accuracy, the MacBook Pro 16 is one of the co most color accurate screens on the market. The 13 inch is good, but not as good as the MacBook Pro 16. Moving on to the fans, this is something that really intrigued me when using the MacBook Pro 16 and MacBook Pro 13 M1 and Premiere Pro. And what I saw was that the Pro 16 would ramp up its fans during the 4K export to around 56 decibels. However, when conducting these same tests, the 13-inch M1 never kicked on its fans. Now, granted, the Pro 16 performed faster in these tests, and I will get into those test results in just a minute. But if you want a quiet laptop, well then, without a doubt, the Pro 13 M1 is gonna be your go-to. If you're enjoying this video and getting some value ever so gently, just gently, just gently, press down on that like button. It helps the algorithm know that you're enjoying this video. Also, let me know in the comment section how you plan on using this laptop by dropping a comment below. If you want more content like this in the future, then make sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss out on any of the future uploads. On to the main event, the performance benchmarking test between the Apple MacBook Pro 16 and the MacBook Pro 13M. The Apple MacBook Pro 16 I'm reviewing comes with the Intel Core i7-9750H with six cores and 12 threads, the AMD Radeon Pro 5300M with four gigs of GDDR6 VRAM, 16 gigs of RAM, and 512 gig SSD. Whereas the MacBook Pro M1 has the Apple M1 8 core, 8 thread, 8 core GPU, plus 16 core neural engine, 8 gigs of RAM, and 512 gig SSD. As you will see, I'm comparing base models 
to base model. I wanted to compare what Apple offers in its performance at a base model level for each of these laptops. So that's why there's a slight difference in RAM. Just before diving into these tests, I want to mention my deep review of the new Apple MacBook Pro 13 and its historic M1 chip. If you're curious why this is such a big moment in Apple history and what makes the M1 laptop so good, then check out the video in the YouTube cards above. Kicking things off, let's talk about graphic design, photo editing, and digital art. I use Photoshop Puget Systems benchmark test to see how well this laptop will handle the most intense tool in Adobe's design suite. If a laptop can handle Photoshop, then it will be suitable for InDesign Illustrator as well. Oh, and if you're not a Adobe user, this is a great test for the capability in similar tools such as Figma, Sketch, and the Affinity Suite. Both laptops perform well, but I must say the MacBook Pro 16 really took the prize on this test, scoring an 813 over the MacBook Pro M1's 565. Now, as I'm discussing the implications of this test, I will pull up the Cinebench and Geekbench scores when this laptop first launched. We saw tons of reviews praising the Cinebench and Geekbench scores of this laptop and they are praiseworthy. The M1 does perform very well in the simulated benchmarks. But my concern, which is confirmed in the Photoshop benchmarks here, is that the test benchmarks such as Cinebench and Geekbench can't tell how a laptop will perform when placed into a real world application such as Photoshop. Now let's talk through these results. First and foremost, this is a great score. If you observe the other laptops that are scoring around this same score, you will see the laptops of the likes of the HP Omen, the Lenovo Legion 5i, the Acer Spin 5, the Gigabyte Aero 15. You will also see that it is outperforming its doppelganger, doppelganger, doppelganger I don't even really ever know how to say that word, but people say it all the time, so I'm trying to use it. The MacBook Pro 13 inch with its Intel i5, by more than 140 points. So the M1 is beating out its current doppelganger by 140 points, meaning that this laptop will showcase excellent performance for graphic designers, photo editors, and digital artists. It is about a 1.54 times improvement over the same chip from the same year coming from Intel. Does that make sense? So M1, one and a half times better than Intel right now where we stand and this isn't even on apple silicon native okay so this is on rosetta 2. so rosetta 2 enables a mac with apple silicone to use apps built for a mac with an intel processor rosetta 2 works in the background whenever you use an app built only for mac computers with intel processors it automatically translates the app for the use with Apple Silicon. So with that in mind, we are seeing performance based on apps not built for Apple Silicon, meaning that right out of the gate, even with the CPU doing emulations in the background, it is outperforming its Intel counterpart, as well as only scoring behind its big brother, the MacBook Pro 16 by a mere 248 points. Plus, let us not forget that the Pro 16 has a dedicated GPU to help it out, whereas the Pro 13 M1 does not have this very helpful component. Now. The GPU doesn't do a ton in Photoshop, but it does help in some of the specific Photoshop tasks that were run during that Puget Systems test. So it's not gonna always be helping you in Photoshop, but there are some tasks in Photoshop that it will help with. So long story short for Photoshop is, this is a great laptop for designers, photo editors, and digital artists, yes. Will it get even better when we get native apps for Apple Silicon? Yes and yes. Okay, so let's get into motion graphics to see how well each laptop handles After Effects. Per the charts, you can see that the Pro 16 pulled ahead of the Pro M1. Again, the Pro 16 scored a 706 over the MacBook Pro M1's 641. The dedicated GPU definitely gives the Pro 16 a big advantage over the M1. I personally would only use the M1 for light After Effects work. If you're wanting to get serious in After Effects, there is no doubt I would snag the Pro 16. Now onto my favorite benchmark test, video editing. First, I'm gonna start off with the playback test. For this test, I'm gonna use a nine minute 4K clip, adding some motion graphics, and then playing it back in the timeline at full quality. This clip contains 16,177 frames in total, with 7,240 of those frames being motion graphics. The MacBook Pro 16 can play back full quality 4K footage in the Premiere Pro timeline with drop frame rates of zero, so it does not drop any frames. The MacBook Pro M1 received a less exciting playback result. It can play back 4K footage in the Premiere Pro timeline as follows. 
At full quality, 5,481. At half quality, 375 drop frames. And at fourth quality, zero drop frames. Considering that I was only running Premiere Pro during these tests, you may see slightly higher drop frames while multitasking, but you can easily switch to half or fourth quality to continue to get smooth playback in the timeline. Concerning the rendering of motion design effects, I was able to render out the 7,240 frames in just four minutes and 50 seconds using the MacBook Pro 16, and a bit slower at seven minutes and 43 seconds out of the Pro M1. Both are impressive times for that render test. But as we see, the Pro 16 stood out on top. Moving on to the 4K export test, I'm going to take a 9 minute 4K clip, place it in Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve using the free version of DaVinci Resolve, then export both out at 1080p and 4K YouTube settings. The Pro 16 Premiere Pro 4K to 4K export took 5 minutes and 41 seconds, and the Pro M1 took 5 minutes and 51 seconds. The Pro 16 4K to 1080p export took 1 minute and 39 seconds, and the Pro M1 took 9 minutes and 15 seconds. Unfortunately, I don't have the results for DaVinci Resolve for the Pro 16, but I do have the results for the M1. The Pro M1 DaVinci Resolve 4K to 4K export took 7 minutes and 45 seconds, and the DaVinci Resolve 4K to 1080p export took 2 minutes and 57 seconds. The ultimate question, which laptop should you choose for video editing? Well, regarding playback, what is the experience when you're editing your videos? What kind of experience do you want? Do you want to Glitchy, laggy experience, or do you want a smooth playback? I would choose the MacBook Pro 16 all the way, especially for 4K. Now, if you bump the Pro 13 M1 down to fourth quality, you should have pretty solid editing experience. So with that in mind, they both could work well. But if you're having massive 4K and 6K projects with a lot of different camera angles, and you're trying to clip all those together, the MacBook Pro 16 will serve you better. But as you load on more and more motion graphics, color grading, layers, effects, you will inevitably start to bog down the laptop and its absence of the dedicated GPU. The M1 is an amazing CPU, but it does not have the support of that nifty GPU. Plus, we are currently only seeing how it performs through Rosetta, so who knows how well it will perform once uh, all of these apps become native to Apple Silicon. But only time will tell. Once again, where I stand today, if you're considering getting a new laptop for heavy 4K video editing, motion design, and the like, I would hold out for the MacBook Pro 16 M1X or M2, whatever it ends up being named. But perhaps you can't wait till what looks like late 2021 release date perhaps. In that case, I would still put my money on the Pro 16 where I sit today. But if you're a graphic designer, photo editor, or digital artist, then the 13 inch M1 will be a great fit for you. If you're curious about the exact availability or pricing of either of these laptops, you can head down in the description below and click one of those links. Now, if you do make a purchase of that link, we'll get a small commission, but at no extra cost to you. That's keeps this channel alive and the helpful content coming your way. If you want more videos about the Apple MacBook Pro 16 or the M1, click or tap the screen over here. Otherwise, keep editing, keep designing, keep creating. I'm Benji Kaiser, and I'll see you here in the next video.